Thanks, Mutaz. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation too, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, as I was driving over and saw the forecast, I thought, well, maybe there will be three people there tonight, but there's more than three, so that's, that's always uh, good news. Um, learning outcomes, uh, there they are for you. I'm going to try and update your understanding of etiology, talk about this relatively uh, interesting concept of boundary or overlap pain syndromes and how difficult that is to, to juggle in clinical practice. Um, how orofacial pain syndromes sit within the wider body because they may simply be manifestations of other disease processes. Uh, how we might manage people with orofacial pain syndromes um, and an understanding very importantly, particularly in a medical audience, the need for uh, your liaison with dental colleagues um, to exclude dental pathology. Um, and that is very much for me a take home message. So here you are, a Gleska Muth. Um, it's, you know it's a Gleska Muth. Well, you don't really know it's a Gleska Muth. There's no fracture in this slide, so <laughs> it may not be a Gleska Muth, um, but it's certainly a West of Scotland mouth. Um, so very few upper teeth, uh, some lower teeth. There's a partial upper denture, which may be worn when the individual leaves the house. And where do you start? So patient presenting with bilateral facial pain. Um, is it dental? Is it neuropathic? Is it psychogenic? Uh, where do you start? Well, that's a very good question and hopefully by uh, the time we finish tonight you might have um, an answer to that. Um, I want to talk about um, a number of entities tonight. Um, I'm not going to cover all of these tonight, uh, but I certainly do want to talk about this concept of uh, putting people into a package, people putting into a diagnostic box, i.e. a true pain syndrome, or whether they have one of the boundary or overlap pain syndromes. And it's really important that we understand that concept. So you will see people at clinic uh, who have symptoms of certain conditions and symptoms of other conditions and indeed symptoms of perhaps other conditions as well. And the big question is, what actually is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? And even up to about 10 years ago, we would compartmentalize these people into one diagnostic box. And I think increasingly our thinking is that's not very helpful. Increasingly, we have to widen the scope and say, well, actually, you may have bits of that diagnosis and bits of that diagnosis and bits of a third diagnosis as well. And I'll say why that's important as we go through but it's really important that we understand where does the patient sit in all of this. And why is that important? Because the management for the, the different aspects of their pains from different sources may indeed be very different. So it's important that we don't early on compartmentalize someone, drill down, if you'll pardon the pun, into one diagnosis, but perhaps step back and say, well, there are elements of that, and there are elements of that, and there are maybe even elements of that as well. So what am I going to deal with tonight? Well, I'm going to deal with the relatively commonplace things tonight. So that would be the temporomandibular disorders, way top of the list, way top of the list. But as you're going to hear from me, that's a wide field, the temporomandibular disorders. It's not one diagnosis at all. And if you don't take anything else away from tonight's talk, please take away from the fact that the temporomandibular disorders are a wide diagnostic field, not one diagnosis. Okay, really important. Next up are the chronic mid-face pain uh, symptoms, um, now perhaps better known as persistent idiopathic facial pain, and then the oral dysesthesias, my delight and my joy. They're brilliant, I love them, they're really complex, but you can make a difference with them, okay? What I can't deal with tonight, and I'm sorry about this, and Mutaj, you may need to have me back if you'll have me back, uh, but I might have to come back and deal with the TCAs, that's the trigeminal uh, cephalalgias, um, and the neuralgia forum disorders, so particularly uh, trigeminal neuralgia and glossopharyngeal neuralgia, because I just don't have enough uh, time tonight to get these um, all into the box for you. So why am I starting with temporomandibular disorders this evening? Because you've got them in the room. That's the most helpful point, okay? So all of you will at some point have, like, have experienced some aspect of temporomandibular disordered pain. So 100% of women, and I'm sorry ladies, but uh, one of the things, particularly about orofacial pain, and perhaps with whole body pain as well, is that women present more in diagnosis with pain than men do. 
Um, and I had an old professor who used to tell me why that was. And the reason was that women are much more inquiring. Okay? So women want to pursue a diagnosis. Men are happy to sit at the bank and say, well, um, women are much more intelligent and much more inquiring and much more wishing to pursue a diagnosis. Okay? Mainly women here tonight. Okay, so <laughs> I don't want Lynch going out the door. Um, so it is reckoned in some studies 100% of women, 75% of men will have symptoms of temporomandibular disorders over their lifetime. And we know that they're badly dealt with. They're badly taught in medical school. Those of you have come through medical or nursing school, when were you taught about temporomandibular disorders? Never. Okay, so at undergraduate level, they're not terribly well taught in our medical schools, better taught in our dental schools, uh, but we can still do better. And for some, it's described as a black art. Um, management is a black art, some people have said. So important issues for you tonight to take away um, about the temporal disorders, but about pain syndromes generally, I think, is that you need to have confidence at the medical dental interface. Doctors don't have all the answers and dentists don't have all the answers. But if you combine those two professional groups in the same uh, consultation, even if that's at a distance, you should get a better through process for your patient. So confidence in working with dental personnel, if you're a doctor or working in the context of a medical clinic, is very important. Taking time to be empathetic, really tough in the middle of a busy di diagnostic NHS service, really tough. But you will never be a successful head and neck pain practitioner, and perhaps not even a successful any type of pain practitioner, unless you have time and space to deal with patients. You may as well just go home. And if your service can't offer that, just close it down. Because it ain't going to work. Okay? The diagnosis is essential. As I get on in years, um, I've been bald since I was 16, so I can't tell you that it's because I've lost hair that I'm gaining any wisdom. But... Um, as I go on in years, I begin to understand the importance of a diagnosis for a patient. And that is the start of their journey, it's not the end of their journey. So even if it's for you a simple diagnosis, make sure the patient knows the diagnosis. Okay? And that's nowhere more important than with the orofacial pain syndromes. People need to know what they've got. And it needs to be the right diagnosis. So don't just fob them off with any diagnosis, give them the right diagnosis. And the other issue is raising expectations. I use a very important phrase when I'm working with pain patients, and it's one you might want to use. Um, I tell them, I'm not Harry Potter. Okay? Pretty obvious I'm not Harry Potter because I don't have the scar on the forehead, but I'm not Harry Potter. So I'll say, this is your diagnosis, and I will work with you to the best of my abilities, but I'm not Harry Potter. And I think it's a good phrase because it says, I think I can help you, but please don't raise your expectations too high because I'm a mortal. I'm a human being. That was, I am a mortal, incidentally, not I am immortal. Um, I am a mortal, um, and uh, I don't want to raise too many expectations. Take-home messages. Well, Michael's already raised one of these, and that is particularly when you deal with older people, unilaterality, okay, so two thoughts here, unilaterality, a throbbing, relatively continuous or continuous headache or facial pain, think about giant cell arteritis, okay? So anyone 60 or over, unilateral throbbing headache, think about giant cell arteritis and make sure that you exclude it. Next up, and really importantly, and tonight's prize-winning take-home message, bilateral facial pain is a temporomandibular disorder until proven otherwise, okay? You don't need to worry about it bilaterality, two sides facial pain is a temporomandibular disorder till proven otherwise. Dead easy, dead easy. You've got your diagnosis now, okay, you can go home. Will we just chuck it, that's it, dead easy, okay? Next up, take time and use diagrams. I am a very visual person. That could be misconstrued, I guess, because I'm a very unvisual person, I get that, before you smile too widely. Um, but I use diagrams a lot, okay, and they're really important. And you can draw them there and then, or you can have preformed ones. But when you're talking about the masticatory apparatus, really important to have some diagrams around with you to use. And you can use dead simple ones like this. 
you can draw them. I tend to draw them. I just turn to the back of the patient case notes. Oh, we still use case notes. We've not gone all paperless just yet. Turn to the back of the case notes and I draw the diagram and say, there's your lateral pterygoid muscle. That's the bit that you are clenching and grinding with. That's the bit that's causing you problems. There's the disc. That lateral pterygoid muscle's attached to the disc and it's pulling the disc out of position. Oh, is that all that's happening? Yeah. And you know why it's happening? Because you're chewing gum. Stop chewing chewing gum. Put it in the bin. Oh, I can't stop chewing gum. Well, you'll have facial pain. Bye. Stop chewing gum. Okay? Stop chewing chewing gum. Everybody chews chewing gum. Stop chewing chewing gum. It's a disaster. Stop chewing chewing gum. Okay? Dead simple. You don't need high-powered medicine in treating facial pain syndromes. You need to tell people to stop chewing chewing gum. Okay? Well, I didn't think about that. Yes, stop chewing chewing gum. Okay? It's chronic repetitive stress injury of the masticatory apparatus. So, sore arms. Yes. Sore face. Dead easy. What is a temporomandibular disorder? Well, a temporomandibular disorder is not the man from the Bradford and Bingley Building Society because it doesn't exist anymore. It's an umbrella term. Okay? So a, the temporomandibular disorders are an umbrella term which describe all the things that you would have in your normal surgical sieve. So that's what? Inflammatory, neoplastic, traumatic, blah, blah, blah. They're all in there. So the temporomandibular disorders, a large umbrella term. And then we're back to the diagram again. Why am I back to the diagram again? Oh, let's get colour into this thing. It must be better. They'll be falling asleep by this time. Put colour in because it'll keep them awake. Because it's great. Okay, back to the diagram. See, Mr. Smith, here's what this jaw joint looks like. This is why you're having problems. Okay? Do you understand that? Oh, I think so now. Yeah. Classification system I'm not going to waste any time with because it's late in the evening and you've had a busy day. And this is the last slide that you want to see at this time of the evening. Why have I put it here, though? I've put it here to remind you and to remind me that the temporomandibular joint, the masticatory apparatus, is not just about the joint. It's about the muscles round about the joint. And in fact, they are the more important element of the masticatory apparatus. So we've got this rate, um, the arrangement of the condyle disc complex. So temporomandibular joint, articular surface top, Articular surface bottom, lower jaw, moves like this, dead easy. Inside there, there is what? A disc, okay? A fibrocartilaginous disc, which breaks it up into the top compartment and the lower compartment. That disc moves back and forward. So as the people chew their gum back and forward, the disc moves and you get click, 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 click. Okay, so that's a classical story. Click, 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 click. A little bit of overactivity of the lateral pterygoid muscle. And then they waken up one morning with that long history of click, 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 click. And there are lights are about to go on in the room because some of you have had this experience. And then you go with your nightie on or your jammies on to, to put your cornflakes in your mouth. You open wide and poof, the world stops. Because the lateral pterygoid muscle that has allowed the disc to click, click, click back and forward goes into spasm and hauls the disc out of position. So you get disc displacement without reduction. No longer do you get clicking. So click, 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 click. One morning, open your mouth wide to yawn or have your cornflakes. <sighs> clicking goes, but pain comes. Disc displacement without reduction. Positive factors, stress, nobody's stressed in the modern world, 2016, nobody's stressed, people are getting less stressed, stress is going away, stress is becoming a thing of the past. Um, everything's about stress, everything's about stress. So no obvious reason, but we think that the no obvious reason patients are actually people who are para-functioning, so people who are clenching and grinding their teeth a lot. So, in fact, you could probably combine the 17% and the 61% into, what's that, a 78%. So, over three quarters of people are probably getting their facial pain, their TMD-related facial pain, because of clenching and grinding their teeth. How do you make that diagnosis? You stick your finger up into the upper buccal sulcus and get them to close down. Masseter curtain comes round your finger. And without you squeezing hard at all, bingo, you've got your diagnosis. Do it on both sides. Oh, bilateral means temporomandibular disorder. Did you get that the first time? Yep. Yep. Unilaterality, mm, wee bit concerned. Bilaterality, temporomandibular disorders. Okay. Clenching and grinding because of stress. Just a pain in the neck. Well, remember that this area here, the angle of the mandible here, 
is innervated not by the trigeminal nerve system, but by the cervical nerve. So C2, C3, this bit here, actually a really helpful way of discerning psychogenic pain in the trigeminal system from any other type of pain. Because if you are prodding and finding pain, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm into this cervicogenic area now. Really good way of catching people out. So C2, C3 over the angle of the mandible, is it cervicogenic? Because that's where the pain will be focused if you're getting cervicogenic pain. Can you ask the patient to open wide? Yes, with a gloved finger. And I know that some of you will have bigger fingers than others in the room, but if you can get three fingers... Just try it. You get three fingers in? Three fingers. Yeah, manage it. Three fingers. You don't have a temporomandibular disorder. Then. At least you don't have a TMD that's impacting your function. So 35 millimeters interincisal opening. Okay, if you can do that, you're fine. The majority of people with temporomandibular disorders can't do any more than that. Can you get a finger? Oh, one finger. Oh, two fingers. Oh, can't open any wider. Good way of determining. Opening consistency, though, okay, so you say, can you open wide? Oh, no, I can't open wide, open wide. Ah, oh, la, 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 la. What do you do? You sing? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to examine you, right? Open wide. And w when you distract them, sometimes you can get a better indication of what's going on. People are obsessed with noises, obsessed with noises, clicking, grinding, graping, whatever they talk about. Forget about noises. Noises are not terribly important in the diagnosis of temporomandibular disorders. So, patient with pain, bilaterality. Unless you work in Glasgow where, yes, you can have toothache on both sides at the same time because you have no looked after your mouth. Um, yes, that can happen. But bilaterality of pain is what? Temporum dibble disorder. Thank you very much for staying awake. I do appreciate it. You'll get one of the redundant cakes at the end. So rule out odontogenic pain. How do you do that? You, you can't do that. You're not a dentist, so you can't do that. So you need to liaise with a dental practitioner to send the patient physically to them and say, does this patient have anything in their mouth that is causing pain? Okay, and ask them to do that. Examine the muscles. Think about putting your finger into the upper buccal sulcus, both sides, um, and get them to close down. Tenderness of the masseter muscles, indicative of a temporomandibular disorders. And just remember, please, about mylohyoid spasm. Mylohyoid muscle is the big muscle here that's the diaphragm muscle that sits under your mandible. I once played squash. I know that you probably don't believe that now, but I played it relatively competitively. And there was one day I got smacked right here with a squash ball. Okay, I also had a detached retina. It wasn't the same day, but here... And I can't explain to you the pain that I felt because I had resultant mylohyoid spasm. So every time I tried to breathe, move, or do anything, the spasm in the mylohyoid muscle was remarkable. Now, I know I'm a mere man, and pain's always worse when, you, when a man, but it was pretty sore, okay? So I now understand a bit of what it feels like when you've got mylohyoid spasm. So if you've got mylohyoid spasm related to clenching and grinding, it's jolly sore. Okay, so palpate myelohyoid as well. Examine the temporal mandibular joints. Any effusions, you need to think about inflammatory disease and any uh, swellings around that area. You need to think about other pathologies as well, like um, issues of pathology within the salivary glands adjacent, and you might want to uh, scan those individuals. So principles of management, temporal mandibular disorders, tell them the diagnosis. You have a temporal mandibular disorder. Real important. Explain the diagnosis, diagram, muscle, joint, movement, clicking, how you're going to do that. Reassure them that they're not going to die, okay, because it feels like the end of the world, okay. <coughs> Principles are get the patient comfortable, and that means simple analgesia. That means uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories and or paracetamol and or diazepam. Okay, now we're very shy about diazepam, uh, but di diazepam is great for a short course. Why is it great? Because it emphasizes to the patient, your diagnosis is right, it's a muscle spasm issue, and you're going to get them better. Okay, so diazepam for a short course is great. Stop them chewing chewing gum. Have you heard that before? Stop them chewing chewing gum. Stop it. Treat the patient, not the noises, so don't tell them to kind of downplay the issue about clicking and grating in their, in their joints. Radiographs, well, we're not supposed to take radiographs anymore of um, therapeutic benefit. They're all supposed to be diagnostic, and I disagree a wee bit with this, because if you go with a sore leg to see 
um, a consultant orthopaedic surgeon, you get a radiograph, you get an x-ray taken. Um, and that is helpfully diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic because you're able to put it up on your screen and say, everything's fine. And I do anticipate there is a bit of therapy in being able to take just a plain radiograph of a facial skeleton, put it up on the screen and say to the patient, you know how you thought you would something serious or wrong? You don't. So there's a therapeutic um, value in radiography for me, which we're being kind of prevented from. And then you're going to make a decision. Is this primarily joint? So is there difficulty in opening? Is there grating and screaming? Or is it primarily um, a muscular, muscular problem? Lots of issues with temporomandibular disorders in people who sit at desks all day long, and it's an axial skeletal issue. So it's a muscle spasm issue related to posture, as well as clenching. You need to meet the deadline for the boss. So important that you allow people to recognize that their facial skeleton is part of their axial skeleton. They need to relax, stand up, and shake down um, periodically. Uh, they need to massage muscles, so alternating hot and cold. And do be aware of gym junkies, because if you're bench pressing, all day long, you're clenching and grinding to do it. And be aware of people who are swimming, swimming, swinging their jaw from side to side as they swim. Analgesia I've talked about already. Simple analgesia with or without diazepam uh, as a kind of 7 to 10 day management strategy. Very, very helpful. And then have a look at how good their function is. Is it not? Splint therapy is then the mainstay of treatment, so dentist takes an impression, provides the patient with an occlusal appliance, a flat bite plane to use. Evidence that around a third uh, stop or have a significant reduction in their symptoms, a third show minor improvement, so that's two thirds showing some change with a final third having no improvement in their symptoms at all. And for some people, particularly when we make it a soft splint, so that's the easiest one to make, so-called Wenvac splint, which is uh, the, the kind of thing you would wear for contact sports. There is some evidence that in a small percentage of people, they actually like the experience of that in their mouth and they actually chew into it. It's a bit like having chewing gum in your mouth. The proprioceptive fibers like that a wee bit and you actually clench and grind a wee bit more. Disc displacement with, order, with uh, disorders, I've talked already about the disc moving and coming out. And when it comes out, that's this acute closed lock situation. So click, 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 click. Previous noises, then lateral pterygoid muscle spasm pulls the disc out of position and you're stuck. So the noises go away, but the pain crescendos. It's a horrific, horrific experience. Um, you should treat that not quite the medical emergency of the patient with the uh, severe sudden onset headache. But if you can't eat and you can't drink, then it's a relative medical emergency. Um, so just watch how it goes over the first 24 hours or so. And you might want your MaxFax colleagues to take a look at that individual. And they will probably arrange MRI scanning just to confirm that the disc is exactly where they think it is. Those individuals might benefit from arthroscopy or arthrocentesis. We don't tend to do very much now by way of surgical intervention in temporomandibular disorders, but this is a situation where we may just indeed throw in um, arthroscopy or arthrocentesis. If you have disc displacement without reduction, so click, 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 click um, all the time, um, and then it goes, so disc displacement without reduction, and it's a chronic state, then again, you would use a stabilization splint. If, so anterior repositioning splints are very important um, in managing patients with chronic uh, disc displacement without reduction. Really important that we talk a little bit, and uh, Michael mentioned this earlier about myofascial pain. Um, dentists talk all the time about myofascial plate pain. If you look through any of the diagnostic classification systems, there's no such thing as myofascial pain. It is myofascial pain, okay? And the reason that's important, um, and you may think I'm being very pernickety about that, is it's to remind us all that myofascial pain is often a whole body phenomenon. So if you simply pick out the head and neck and say, this is myofascial pain, you might in fact lose sight of the fact that you've got someone with a chronic musculoskeletal disorder. Um, and it's really important that we don't do that. So this is where assessing the whole individual patient is very important. So do they have whole body myofascial pain? Do they have fibromyalgia? They will certainly have tiredness and fatigue as part of this. 
Um, and if you do see all of that, then clearly you're into a co much more complex management situation and you would want to refer these patients either uh, to ourselves uh, for uh, assessment or into your chronic pain teams um, to get the appropriate management of those individuals. Muscle pain alone, um, you need to think about the possibility of autoimmune inflammatory disease and we do occasionally pick up these. Uh, in, in younger women in particular. So you need to think about, is this lupus? Is it rheumatoid? Is it Sjogren's? Is it a mixed connective tissue picture? Um, and that emerges over time uh, by way of investigation. So if you find an individual who's not resolving uh, in, in your management strategy, then you need to think about the possibility of a myositis in front of you. Check their inflammatory markers, check their autoimmune antibodies, um, and then move on as you might do for other uh, autoimmune inflammatory disorders, non-steroidals, um, and the disease-modifying agents once you've got your diagnosis. Patients often come to clinic and say, my bite has changed. Um, when someone says to you, my bite has changed, either they've got a fracture, and sometimes that happens because people fall on ice, people get assaulted, people have road traffic accidents, and it can be some weeks later that the manifestations of that actually emerge. So do think about the possibility of um, a fracture even later on in time. But the majority of people who come to clinic and say, my bite has changed, are actually having that because they've got unilateral lateral pterygoid muscle spasm, which has pulled the disc slightly out of position, and it's causing the proprioceptive fibers around the capsule of the temporal mandibular joint to say there's something not quite right here. In order to treat lateral pterygoid spasm, it's quite helpful that they hold their mandible in the most retruded contact. So you get them to move their mandible right back where they would normally bite into a much more back space position and hold that for 30 seconds, repeat it five more times and do that three or four times a day. You can also put some diazepam and analgesic stuff in there as well. It's quite painful to do that to start with when you've got lateral pterygoid spasm. And then other therapies which are available to you in addition to the acute side of things, non-steroidals, paracetamol um, and diazepam, then moving into splint therapy, occlusal splint therapy made and modified by a dental surgeon or then into the, the other types of uh, therapies that are available to you. Physiotherapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, CBT, very good at habit breaking if people are clenching and grinding, as is hypnosis, and we've got a very good hypnosis service um, here in the dental school in Glasgow, and other stress management strategies as well. And that takes us back to the majority of temporal mandibular disorders being stress-induced and related to clenching and grinding. <clears throat> Outcome for patients with temporal mandibular disorders, and I now move to the next mainstay of treatment, which is the use of uh, the tricyclic antidepressants. The tricyclic antidepressants note, um, not other types of antidepressants. And this is a very old study, it's 30 odd years old now, from Feynman and Harris in London, who looked at 93 patients with TMJ, temporal mandibular joint pain dysfunction syndrome, so muscle spasm, painful joints related to clenching and grinding. And if you just look at the, the numbers here, they're very interesting because you will see that 43% of these patients had no psychiatric diagnosis, but 57% of them had an overt psychiatric diagnosis. And Charlotte Feynman is a consultant psychiatrist who's made the diagnosis um, appropriately and fully. So 57% of people presenting with temporal mandibular joint dysfunction have a diagnosable underlying psychiatric illness. So there is a degree of psychiatric or psychological overlay for these patients with temporal mandibular disorders. And important, yes, so you'll remember if we go back a slide, if you add those together, we've got 57% of people, so just over half of people, with a psychiatric diagnosis. And then you come to outcomes and 73%, so 57% becomes 73% responding to dothiapin. So it's not, not just about psychiatric response, it's clearly about muscle spasm and response to pain controlling drug as well. But a very significant response to placebo as well, which emphasizes again that there is a significant psychological or psychiatric overlay uh, for this condition in these patients. 
Surgical intervention uh, we tend to shy away from now for all kinds of reasons. Big study from the States uh, looking at over 2,000 patients with temporal mandibular disorders of all types and 0.1 uh, going to open joint procedures. Some going to arthrocentesis, just over one in a hundred going to uh, for arthrocentesis and about 1% going for arthroscopy. So the take home message again for the temporal mandibular disorders is they are managed conservatively now. Don't rush them into theatre to do big surgery on them because for the most part it's not helpful and nor is it required. When might you want to ask our maxillofacial colleagues to see your patients? There's certainly a role for that referral and it would be the acute um, closed lock situation. If you think that uh, particularly a child, uh, but also adults, because this can be a malignant presentation, get ankylosis of the temporal mandibular joint, infection, so red swellings around the temporal mandibular joints, history or threat of fracture, any possibility obviously of neoplasm, and particularly in children and adolescents, young adults, if there's any asymmetry around uh, the facial skeleton, then those individuals should be referred for uh, surgical assessment as well. Degenerative joint disease we're seeing much more of, and one might argue that degenerative joint disease is simply being picked up more because we're imaging more, so we see these coincidental findings on MRI or CT scanning. But also people are living longer, and your masticatory apparatus like your heart or your big toe or whatever it might be probably has a finite life to it, um, and it's beginning to give up the ghost a little bit. Um, so we see lots of radiographic imaging of osteophytosis, lots of beaking of the condylar heads. And what's really interesting about degenerative joint disease in the temporal mandibular joints is that this disorder does not appear to behave in the same way as your granny's hip or your granny's knee might behave with degenerative joint disease. And if you stop the habit, i.e. the clenching and grinding, often you get spectacular remodeling of the bony condyles um, around the temporal mandibular joints. Um, so they can self-heal, which is really interesting. Um, unlike uh, other weight-bearing joints, but there are some people that we take to um, surgery because they just the joints just disappear, they just fall apart, and you can do a temporal mandibular joint replacement as you can do a, a knee or a hip replacement um, as well. Uh, just a final note before I move on from the temporal mandibular disorders about, wait for it, chewing gum. Uh, because we're now seeing um, imaging of degenerative joint disease in 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds that I only saw in 85 year olds previously. And there is no doubt in my mind that that is related to gum chewing. It's the only thing that it can possibly be. Um, so whilst chewing gum is apparently quite good to stop dental decay and bad breath, there's a downside to chewing gum as well, which um, you may have heard of now. So, cracking on, chronic mid-face pain, moving away from temporal medibular disorders to chronic mid-face pain. You will have heard in some quarters this called atypical facial pain. You might now hear of it called persistent idiopathic facial pain. Um, atypical facial pain, I think, should now be called persistent idiopathic facial pain, uh, but there is um, an attempt, I think, within the classification to allow us to um, distill down a little bit that classification, that diagnosis, um, to allow us to call something atypical odontalgia, where it's more localised to one or two teeth, atypical periodontalgia, where it's the gum that's involved, the supporting structure for teeth, and then causalgia, also called complex regional pain syndrome, which tends to follow on from some degree of surgical uh, insult, fracture, previous surgery, biopsy, or whatever it's an extraction, and there are clear autonomic features um, to that particular presentation. Once again, it tends to affect women more than men and tends to present in the late 40s. Um, there tends to be a neuropathic element to this and often there is pre-existing dental intervention. So there's been some long-standing problem, pain uh, related to a particular tooth. That tooth has been root treated, re-root treated new fillings done, crowns done on it, and then eventually the tooth is extracted, and lo and behold, the pain doesn't go away when the tooth is extracted. So that would be something that would be diagnosed as an atypical odontalgia variant. 
Uh, you, I'm sure, are well aware of the typical presentation. It tends to be a dull ache or a throbbing pain. It's described as low-level, mild to moderate pain, but actually something that is quite debilitating for people. Tends to be unilateral, tends to be there all the time, and interestingly, increasingly, as we talk about boundary and overlap pain syndromes, it's now estimated that about two-thirds of patients uh, also develop or have in the past had a temporal mandibular disorder. What do you want to do with these patients? Well, you want to fully investigate them. So you want to do a cranial nerve examination. You want to get your dental colleagues to do vitality or sensibility testing to make sure the teeth are alive or dead eh, and treat accordingly. Appropriate dental radiographs or facial skeleton radiographs. You want to exclude maxillary sinus disease. Very importantly, you don't want a fungating tumor to be mimicking eh, atypical facial pain. Again, think about cervicogenic aspects. Psychological assessment is also very important. And increasingly, we're using cone beam CT scanning to look at endodontically, that is, uh, teeth where the, the nerve has been removed um, and filled with a, a, an artificial material, because sometimes there's a bit of infection still left around those teeth, and it's only the detailed cone beam CT scanning that can actually pick that up. So again, liaising with your dental colleagues very important. Management, well, there are few randomized clinical trials of any value, and part of that is because they've been comparing apples and pears, uh, and so it's really important to get the correct diagnosis as you enter any clinical study. Um, pharmacological treatment uh, would be the same in this condition as for persistent idiopathic facial pain. Psychological support, really important, and importantly, no surgical intervention. The literature is quite clear that surgical intervention makes things worse. Obviously, there's a history, or often there's a history, of frequent um, invasive dental treatment, which leads us to a combination of uh, neuropathic and psychological evident, uh, uh, symptoms. Risk factors, history of widespread pain, there seems to be a family clustering of idiopathic facial pain, so there may well be genetic susceptibility. Again, female gender, much more evident. Passive coping traits with poor locus of control. Often the locus of control is passed out to the professional. Do something for me, doctor. Do something. Get sorted so that um, passing out of the locus of control. Poor prognosis, uh, uh, particularly for those who develop psychological distress. Um, this is the persistent idiopathic facial pain. Often it's described as a deeper pain, so instead of it being atypical odontalgia related to the, the tooth structures, it's often more deep within the jaw structure. Often, again, continuous and provoked by stress, fatigue, and cold weather. I couldn't help but drawing some similarities between some of the descriptions that Michael made. Um, it's often, it's, it, it's, it's often it appears like this feels like... Um, uh, a migraine type picture within the teeth um, or the jaw structure because it's often the same precipitant uh, factors that are involved in it. Generalised aches and pains are often described, particularly in the arms, and we get associated uh, medical aspects to patients with persistent idiopathic facial pain, irritable bowel syndrome, headache of various descriptions, neck pain, low back pain, dysmenorrhea, itchy skin, intolerance of cold, and often they come with multiple chemical sensitivities and increasingly inability to use a mobile phone. Often people will come and say, when I use my mobile phone, my pain comes on. Interesting. And increasingly I'm hearing that. I can't give you an explanation for it, but I've learned enough over the years in clinical practice not just to diss everything that I hear. Um, so don't know whether that's a factor or not. And dizziness um, is often a factor as well. We've talked a lot about the associated features Management comes down to drug therapy um, for the most part, with amitriptyline and ruthiapine still being right up at the top um, as drugs that are helpful uh, in these circumstances. Um, if we go down to second from the bottom, we've got cognitive behaviour therapy plus or minus tricyclics, um, and efficacy again uh, seems to be very good. Um, but thought to be more related to um, drug therapy rather than, in these circumstances, CBT. Just to finish chronic mid-face pain, uh, you might be interested to know that around 60-odd percent of patients uh, with mid-face pain also have headache. 
same number of patients have sleep problems, um, and three quarters of these individuals had pain on craniofacial muscle palpation, so they would also fit into the temporal mandibular disorder category. And a staggering 50% of these individuals uh, complained of facial numbness, not uh, correlated with clinical examination uh, during their, their, their pain history. So really interesting group of people and sometimes quite difficult to manage. Finally, and we're nearly done, the oral dysesthesias, uh, which you will have historically heard of as burning mouth syndrome. But I'm going to explain a little bit as to why we no longer call it burning mouth syndrome, because it's not just burning that these patients uh, present with. So the International Headache Society defines burning mouth syndrome as an intraoral burning or dysesthetic sensation recurring daily for more than two hours per day over more than three months without clinically evident causative lesions. Very important. So to define this or to, to, to match the definition of burning mouth syndrome, you must have a clinically normal mouth. So if you look in a mouth and there is a red patch or a swelling or something else, you cannot call this burning mouth syndrome if you're going to meet the uh, definition criteria from IHS. The International Association for the Study of Pain says that this is burning pain in the tongue or other oral mucous membrane associated again with normal signs and normal laboratory features. But importantly, and Joanna Zakrushka, who is our uh, national and international uh, pain expert in this field, says it can be associated with other altered sensations, particularly a dryness or altered taste or bitterness. So that's why we tend to use the term oral dysesthesia rather than uh, burning mouth syndrome. And interestingly, lots of these people um, have, uh, when you talk about dysesthesia of the skin, have this hyperreactivity activity to touch, but that seems not to be the case when it occurs to the mouth. So if you poke these people in their mouth and rumble them around, the pain doesn't get any worse. Uh, so that's quite unusual in terms of the generalised accept definition of dysesthesia. The whole concept of burning must be differentiated from the entity of burning which is caused by other uh, clinical uh, diagnoses like diabetes or anemia. So we tend to talk about the primary burning uh, syndrome when there is no identifiable cause. This is the true burning syndrome, and this is essentially uh, idiopathic, as opposed to the secondary feature of burning where there is an identifiable cause, and that would be diabetes, anemia, drug therapy, uh, denture intolerance, etc. But increasingly, we're tending to put all of this together into a new definition um, and we're calling this COSD, and that is the complex oral sensitivity disorders. Uh, because it's not just burning, it's not just dryness, it's not just altered sensation, uh, but it's a whole complex presentation of altered sensation within the mouth and perioral tissues. Now, when you put up a factors associated slide like that, um, you can see there are local factors, there are systemic factors, and there are psychological factors. That simply emphasizes that we haven't a clue what we're talking about. Okay, we've got no idea. Uh, because we identify that these are all associated factors. Some of them may be causative, some of them are simply implicated factors. But you can see that's a complex group of potential um, etiological factors. Prevalence of burning mouth syndrome, it's not an uncommon syndrome at all, and we see it increasingly at diabetic clinics and in menopausal clinics. And I've put down here that the female-male ratio is 20 to 1, and here's a little take-home message for you as well, and that is we rarely, we rarely see men with burning mouth syndrome. Rarely see men, okay? The men that I have seen over the years with burning mouth syndrome have either got um, um, important underlying systemic disease, so undiagnosed diabetes or anemia, or they're having a marital indiscretion. Okay, interesting. Why would I jump to that? Because clinical experience over the years has suggested to me that men with guilt often react with a burning mouth syndrome, and I'll leave you to work out for yourselves why the mouth might be represented in their guilt syndrome. Okay, and I'm being serious now. Um, not that I haven't been serious for the last 
40 minutes, but I'm being very serious now. And often we see men who have committed some form of indiscretion uh, sexually, uh, and often men who have been faithful for many years, but they've had one glitch. I'm not apologizing for them, ladies, but they've had one glitch, something's happened, and they are appalled by the consequences of it and live with terrible guilt, and that guilt is manifested with this burning sensation. So, I put in there, beware of the man who develops burning mouth syndrome, uh, just to say you might want to just take that individual on a slightly different journey. You need to do your investigations, but he, he may need to talk about um, the guilt aspects um, of, of their presentation. Sights affected, normally the tongue, and it's normally the anterior two-thirds of the tongue that are affected, and then followed by the hard palate. So, tongue followed by palate, and it's uncommon to get it anywhere else in the mouth. Philip Lamy, uh, some years ago, classified burning mouth syndrome, I think, quite helpfully into three types. So, type one is where the patient does not have their burning on wakening, and it develops as the day goes on, and those are often stress-related burners. Type two are the commonest group of all, where they have their burning sensation on wakening. It's unremitting throughout the day, and it's there when they go to bed at night. And that's the commonest group. That's the most that we see. Type 3 are very interesting because they either have burning at different times of the day or at different times of the week, um, or they have it at unusual sites. And the type 3 burners are sometimes the people who are associated with food allergy. Um, we don't see food allergy represented a lot in this group, but you should think about the possibility of food allergy, food hypersensitivity in the type 3 group, because obviously they're only burning when they come in contact with the food that they're reacting to. Theories of etiology I won't bore you with because there are so many of them, but there are five main theories as to why people get this burning mouth syndrome. Um, and this concept of super tasters... Um, which is really interesting. So some women, uh, and it's particularly women, have a higher um, density of the fungiform papillae on their, their tongue, and within these papillae there is a greater concentration of sensory fibres. And those individuals, when you test them with different things, but particularly this 6N propylthiouracil, it's like their life stops. The, the taste is so horrific to them that life almost stops, whereas if you put it in anybody else's mouth, you say, oh, that's a bit uncomfortable, that's a bit horrible. Put this substance in a super taster's mouth, and it's poof. So there's a theory that these individuals are reacting to this super tasting phenomenon. Second theory is a simple one. It's a genuine neuropathy, a small fiber neuropathic process, and I think that's certainly part of it. Third theory is a more centrally mediated um, change. Not quite sure about that. Theory four, I think, is related to the uh, change in the uh, sensory fibres within the oral mucosa, and this is why I think we see it predominantly in women around the age of 50. Some nice studies done in this now where there is a catastrophic change in the, the thickness um, of the oral mucosa because of the reduction in blood supply postmenopausal. A couple of studies have also suggested that when that catastrophic change in the oral mucosa takes place, the nerve fibres change in configuration. So instead of being able to taste nice food and good contact, all of that stuff, they start to taste bad things only. So the configuration of the nerve fibre actually changes within the oral mucosa. And I think that is part of the neuropathic process. So we tend to see this really only in uh, perimenopausal women. And then the whole aspect of stress and anxiety on top of that. And there is no doubt that for some patients, uh, there is a stress or anxiety element to their facial pain syndrome. One of the other associated features which is now just becoming evident is that uh, the majority of people with burning mouth syndrome have a statistically reduced saliva flow. And you might think, well, that's not very important, is it? It is very important. And what I would like you to do tonight is to go home and take three Jacob's cream crackers, okay, and try and eat all three of them, okay, and then sit back and see how much you'll enjoy the rest of your life, okay? Because if you have a very dry mouth, it's a horrific experience. You don't taste anything. You don't taste a nice wine. You don't taste your gin and your gin and tonic. You don't taste the lovely food that's on the plate of an evening. Um, and 
we are now beginning to think that this aspect of burning mouth syndrome, which is probably a peripheral neuropathic process as well, is, is as important as the burning. So reduced salivary flow, an important feature. We've also talked during the course of this evening about this boundary or overlap pain syndrome, and we're now understanding that there may well be an aspect of changing configuration and presentation of facial pain over a lifetime. So you might start with a temporal mandibular disorder, then develop atypical facial pain or chronic mid-face pain, and then develop uh, burning mouth syndrome in later life. And it might be, there may well be a genetic predisposition to that development. So investigations for these patients are very important because it's a multifaceted etiology, a smorgasbord of, of potential etiological factors. So we check their microbiological status, we check their psychosocial morbidity, we look at their salivary flow rates, we check their various uh, basic blood tests, particularly blood sugar, um, and to make sure that they're not um, hematinically challenged. Increasingly, we're understanding about gastroesophageal reflux disease and the influence of other drugs as well um, on the, the onset of their symptoms. And finally, how do we treat these individuals? Well, I've brought you to the Cochrane database, which is where you would want me to go for an evidence-based presentation. And effectively, three things come out of that. Um, they are alpha-lipoic acid. What's alpha-lipoic acid? Alpha-lipoic acid... Um, is an essential element that's involved in the repair of damaged neuronal tissue. So it would fit with the neuropathic process. Alpha-lipoic acid, topical clonazepam, and then cognitive behaviour therapy. Those are the three and only three things, with some exceptions just in a couple of slides' time, just to add to that. So alpha-lipoic acid, um, I'm not going to go into the study with you, uh, with or without the antineuropathic drug gabapentin or pregabalin. So we tend to give, we tend to start off with um, the alpha lipoic acid and then add in after three months or so, if there's no change, um, one of the antineuropathic drugs, pregabalin or gabapentin. Clonazepam, not systemically but topically. How does it work? No idea. Thought to be GABA receptor mediated changes. Uh, really interesting. There's some good work that needs to get done in this. But if you give 500 micrograms topical clonazepam, just suck the tablet and spit it out. Uh, but you're spitting it out, you're not swallowing it. So twice a day, maximally three times a day of topical clonazepam, really good clinical outcome um, and for quite a simple uh, drug use. Um, and then finally, Cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT, um, really good outcome. One big study, uh, but it's a well-designed study suggesting that CBT um, is actually quite helpful in patients with uh, burning mouth syndrome. Others, just to finish, um, now emerging. Duloxetine, um, yes. Uh, some early work suggesting that duloxetine may be helpful in patients with burning mouth syndrome. And the importance of the psychological impact. Um, so reassurance explanatory and information sheets. Very importantly, talk openly, and we talk, all the staff that I'm involved in, talk very openly about suicidal ideation and intent. Really important, really important. Uh, and to raise it and to, to allow the patient to understand how significant you know this condition is impacting them. So assess their psychological status. Um, if you can access CBT, by all means do so. And then move on to alpha lipoic acid with or without antineuropathic drug and add in topical clonazepam. And about two thirds of patients will respond something, uh, some way in that. For the type three burners, sometimes helpful to look at patch testing to make sure that you're not missing something either in the oral environment by way of a dental material or something that they are uh, ingesting. People often ask if it's perimenopausal, why does HRT not work? Well, HRT doesn't work because HRT doesn't take you back to your endogenous hormonal levels and you would need to go way back probably to your endogenous hormonal levels to make it in any way effective. So HRT is a non-starter. Some initial work around the cannabinoids, well, who wouldn't want to get involved in research around cannabinoids? Um, and there's some early suggestion that, that these might be helpful. And then an area of growing interest for me is the interface between chronic pain and sleep disorders. Um, and if you want to get into a growth area for the future, get in there because I think we're going to see that um, our sleep disorder patients have very significant increased experience um, of pain. Three references for you for this evening. Uh, I'm particularly referred throughout my presentation to the work by Joanna Zakrushka and her little book, a little blue book, great wee book called Orofacial Pain. 
easy to read, dead easy to use in a clinical environment. So great book. And then Geoffrey Oakson is the, the past master of facial pain. He wrote Bell's Or of Facial Pain. And uh, if you want to look at temporomandibular disorders, Ed Wright's your man for the job. So I hope that's been helpful in covering quite a lot of ground this evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>